our subject this evening is in the form of a question. And the question is, are we being foolish? And we have to, we have to bring the experience of these Galatian believers out of the past and, and compare their experience with ours. There, are, there is at least one huge difference which I hope to point out. But I think what we can learn from their experience is very instructive. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3 is our focus this evening. And we read from the English Standard Version. Um, some rough words, some rough words. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Let's pray. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind, in purer lives thy service find in deeper reverence praise in simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea the gracious calling of the Lord let us like them without a word rise up and follow thee with that deep hush subduing all our words and works that drown the tender whisper of thy call as noiseless let thy blessings fall as fell thy manna down Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Breathe through the heats of our desire thy coolness and thy balm let sense be dumb let flesh retire speak through the earthquake wind and fire O oh, still small voice of calm in the name of Jesus Christ we pray Amen. Last week we stated that in chapters 3 and 4 we have the doctrinal portion, the doctrinal portion of Paul's letter to the believers in Galatia. In this section, Paul gives a scriptural defense of the gospel. And he does so by addressing the Galatian believers themselves using their example of inconsistent conduct to launch into an exposition of justification by faith. Paul desires to show the Galatians that their present position as it relates to the gospel is a contradiction 
of their own spiritual history. You remember I said to us earlier that there is one glaring difference that I want to point out. And it is here that um, our history and the Galatians are slightly different. Well, much different. I hope to be able to point that out. The essence of Paul's argument is that their new position is a contradiction of the gospel. Contradiction of the gospel. The reason for his astonishment at their folly, their foolishness, their stupidity, is that Jesus Christ had been publicly portrayed as crucified before their very eyes through his preaching and teaching. In verse 1, he writes, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Paul describes them as being foolish. Imagine writing a letter to people and calling them foolish. The word foolish is the translation of a Greek word which literally means not having a mind. The word refers not so much to a lack of intelligence as it does to mental laziness and carelessness. It describes one who demonstrates an unwillingness to use his or her mental faculties to understand. And so, brethren, it's important for us that we don't just expect to be spoon-fed. We have to use our minds and think through the doctrines that we are hearing about. We have to grapple with them mentally. And there are persons who, when they hear something new or strange, they are unwilling to grapple with it, unwilling to process it mentally, unwilling to deal with the implications. They prefer to remain comfortable, even if it is comfortable in error. We cannot afford to be like that. The Anglican Archbishop Richard Trench, who was a Greek New Testament scholar, explains that the Greek word implies that there is always a moral failure lying behind the intellectual failure. The Galatians were lacking not in intelligence, but in obedience to the truth of the gospel. The word bewitched is a translation of a Greek word which in the New Testament has the meaning of subjecting a person to the influence of the occult. The idea is of misleading or seducing persons by flattery, false promises or the occult. And the word clearly suggests the use of feeling over fact, emotion over clear understanding of truth, emotion over clear understanding of truth, feeling over fact. And last week when we were teaching on this, we went to Romans chapter 7, you may remember where Paul says, I serve the Lord with my mind. With my mind. I don't serve him with my emotions. I serve him with my mind. The Galatians were not victims of a magical spell. Rather, they had been misled by teaching 
that they should have readily recognized as false because Paul had thoroughly, vividly, and graphically proclaimed the crucified Christ to the Galatians. The Lord Jesus had been publicly portrayed as crucified before them, and yet their eyes had been diverted from the cross to the law. They were therefore without excuse. The greatest ever teacher of scriptural truth taught them. The one who perhaps more than anybody else had a clear understanding of the gospel. The phrase publicly portrayed is a translation of the Greek word prographo which literally means to write for public reading, announced on a poster. The word was used to describe all public notices or proclamations and indicates a public announcement in which the validity of a particular fact or condition is proclaimed. This is what Paul had done in his proclamation of the gospel in Galatia, he had uh, made a public announcement and underscored the validity of the work of Christ on the behalf of the Galatians. He had laid out the truths of our Lord's Honing work on the cross so clearly that the Galatians had a very clear understanding of its significance. They could see it. They had the plainest possible preaching and teaching from Paul and his companions concerning the substitutionary death of Christ. Jesus Christ had been so clearly set forth before them that they had, as it were, seen him as he hung on the cross of Calvary. Yet under some spell, they had turned aside from the faith of Christ to follow a different gospel, one which made the death of Christ of no efficacy whatsoever. Again, their situation is a little different from ours because they started out by hearing the true gospel. I know that's tough for us to receive. I know it is. We didn't start out by hearing the true gospel. We started out by being exposed to another gospel, which is not another. In the first five verses of this chapter, Paul asks five questions of the Galatians. As one writer observes, Paul, and I quote, pours out question upon question. He wants no answer for himself. He needs none. The Galatians need them for themselves. It is high time they did a little plain Christian thinking. End of quote. By asking these questions, Paul is appealing to the Galatians' own experience. He desires for their own witness to convince them of their error from departing from the gospel of the grace of God. In verse 2, Paul poses the following question to the believers in Galatia. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? 
as I say, let's not just confine this to the Galatians. This question, the second of the five, should have been sufficient to convict them of their folly of drifting from the truth of the gospel that had initially saved them. Because they knew how they had received the Spirit. The question points to the manner in which the Galatian believers had been justified or declared righteous or saved. Those three things mean the same thing. Obviously, they had been justified or declared righteous or saved through the miracle of the new birth and the reception of the Holy Spirit. If then they had been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and as a result had believed on Jesus Christ for their salvation, how could there possibly be any place for works either alone or in addition to faith so far as the obtaining of their salvation was concerned? How could there be? If you didn't have anything to do with your regeneration, you didn't fill yourself with the Holy Spirit, or did you? If you didn't fill yourself with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> how works? How is it that we have introduced works now into our service for Christ? You notice that Paul clearly assumes that all the Galatian believers have received the Holy Spirit. His question is not whether they have received him, not it, received him or not but whether they received him by works or by faith. And, and Paul knows that nobody receives the Holy Spirit by works. But he's saying to them, since you've gone into the foolishness, might as well I join you. What he's asking them is how? How? they received the Holy Spirit. What part did they play in the process? What part did you play in the process, brethren? What part did I play? By the receiving of the Spirit, Paul means the initial entrance of this Holy Spirit into their hearts when they put their trust in the Lord Jesus. Paul asks the Galatians, in effect, did you have to work for the Spirit of God to take up residence in you? Or did he come in when you put your faith in Jesus Christ? They would have answered, they would have answered. I'm not sure how we will answer, but they would have answered. We receive the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Paul is challenging them to remember how they were saved. See, there's a difference. Because if he challenged us to remember how we were saved, we would have a little problem because some of us worked for it. The majority of us probably did. See the difference, brethren? The Galatians would have remembered that they were saved by hearing the gospel that Paul had proclaimed and accepting it by faith. And they would have remembered that they received the Holy Spirit the moment they placed their trust in Jesus Christ and in his death, burial, and resurrection on their behalf, independent of performing any works. 
So brothers and sisters, is this not a question that we should ask ourselves and endeavor to answer honestly? How did our Christian life begin? Did we receive the Spirit by works or by faith? I want you to ask that question of yourself right now individually. How did I receive the Holy Spirit? Did I receive it by hearing of faith or by works? Did I have to tarry for it? Did I have to work for it? Did I have to push for it? And if I had to, if I had to work for it, if I had to work for it, did I really receive the Holy Spirit? What did I receive? It or him. The message translates the verse as follows. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? How was it, brethren? How was it for us? How did you get it? How did I get it? Was there a gap of months after we had believed the gospel that we were quote-unquote filled with the Holy Ghost? Was it a gap of years? during which period we would have been left behind if the Lord had come? We have to grapple with these questions, you know, brethren. I know it's uncomfortable, but we have to. We have to. I'm not trying to be cruel. I don't want to offend anybody unnecessarily, but we have to ask these questions. Paul would have asked these questions. He did. He asked them. The works of the law and hearing with faith are two diametrically opposed ways of salvation. And only one only one hearing with faith leads to true salvation. Faith and works are polar opposites which cannot be mixed. They do not tolerate each other. It must be one or the other. It cannot be a combination of both. The law says you must do this. The gospel says Christ has done it all. Commenting on Galatians chapter 3, 2 to 5, John Stott writes the following. The law requires works of human achievement. The gospel requires faith in Christ's achievement. I want you to think about how you receive the Spirit. Let me read it again. The law requires works of human achievement. Works of human achievement. The gospel requires 
faith in Christ's achievement. Which one of these two systems were we following? The law makes demands and bids us obey. The gospel brings promises and bids us believe. So the law and the gospel are contrary to one another. They are not two aspects of the same thing or interpretations of the same Christianity. At least in the sphere of justification, as Luther says, the establishing of the law is the, abolish, is the abolishing of the gospel. End of quote. Why am I stressing this, brethren? Because I want us to ensure that we are truly saved, you know. Paul says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. And whenever, whenever, whenever New Testament writers ask us to examine ourselves as Paul does and as John does in his first epistle, and he lays out different uh, measurements which will indicate to us whether we are in the faith or not. He never says, go back and remember what happened at an altar. That's never what they say. What is currently taking place in your life and in my life? That's always the measuring rod. The experience of the Galatians was that the Spirit had come by hearing with faith. That is, in reality, always the way that the Spirit comes because that is the only way that the Spirit can come. The Holy Spirit is never worked up. Always sent down. So again, I want to ask, how was it with us? Was, it, was our experience something that we worked up? Or was it something sent down? That experience that we had, was it something that was sent down? You see, brothers and sisters, no one can believe God unless God enables him or her to believe. And he enables us to believe by his word. In Romans 10, 17, we read, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. That's how faith comes. Faith is not an achievement we earn for ourselves. It is a gift that is bestowed on us by God. I don't summon up faith within myself. I can't work up faith within me. I, can, I cannot work up faith within me. I can summon it up. John MacArthur states that, and I quote, the gift 
of the Holy Spirit is the believer's most unmistakable evidence of God's favor, his greatest proof of salvation and the guarantee of eternal glory. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is inseparable from the new birth. At no time before salvation can a person have the indwelling spirit. And at no time after salvation can he not have him. That's scriptural truth. You cannot lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not oil that can leak out. In verse 3, Paul asks his readers two questions that are really one rhetorical question. Again, Paul's logic is devastating, you know. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Here's, here's our dilemma, brethren. Here's our dilemma. If we did not begin by the Spirit, you see, the Galatians begun by the Spirit. But, but, but if a group of people begun in the flesh, they are always going to want to do that. If, if we begun by earning the Holy Spirit, by working for it, we are always going to want to work for salvation. Because, so, so if you were told that you need to make sure your life is clean, because the Lord is not going to enter an unclean vessel, so, you need to show him that you're serious by going on three days fasting. If that's how you were introduced to salvation and you believe that that is what helped you to receive the Holy Spirit, your three days of fasting, then three days of fasting is always going to be the way that you expect to get results from the Lord. God never asked anybody to clean up to come to him. He says, believe. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, will do the cleaning up. So here, here in verse 2, when Paul asked them the question, he, he, he speaks of the initial, the initial entrance of the Holy Spirit into their hearts when they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 3, he's not speaking of the initial work of the Holy Spirit, the initial entrance of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking of the sanctifying work of the Spirit in the lives of the saints. The question in verse 2 is about how one becomes a Christian. While the question in verse 3 is about how one lives as a Christian. So the temptation will always be to live the way that you became. That's, that's the point I was making earlier. Verse 2 deals with justification by faith. While verse 3 deals with sanctification by faith. And that's why in some environments, people actually will question. They'll say, you get the Holy Ghost just like that? 
Because the routine has not been followed. Nobody gets the Holy Ghost like that. You didn't follow our routine. Have you ever seen people being passed to other persons and then passed back again and passed around? And that is to receive the salvation of God, which is his gift of grace, you know. I want us to think about it, brethren, because we are going to have to grapple with it internally. Because one is always tempted to continue living the way one began living. You know that it's the same in the natural as in the spiritual, you know. What we learn in our formative years follows us through life. Paul's argument is a powerful one. If the believers in Galatia had received their initial salvation or justification by trusting in the crucified Christ, and if they had received the Holy Spirit the moment they believed, and if they were experiencing his supernatural transforming power working within them, why would they now endeavor to be sanctified by means of self-effort? Why would they seek to be brought to a state of spiritual maturity by works? The message provides what to my mind, my way of thinking, is a very effective translation of Paul's word to the Galatians. Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? I just think that's an excellent translation. I think that captures what Paul was trying to say. In Philippians 1, 6, Paul writes, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Who was it that began the good work of salvation in us? Was it God? Was it ourselves and our others? If it was God who started the work, then it is he who will bring it to perfection or complete it. If we had a hand in starting it, then we're going to have to bring it to completion. Brothers and sisters, I, as your pastor, don't mind telling you that I have said to the Lord in prayer, if I have to finish this, Let's forget about it right now. If it is left up to me, I've done it done. I wouldn't even bother with it. If you go and do it, then that's fine, because I can trust you. Brothers and sisters, the means of justification and sanctification are the same. We are justified and sanctified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Kenneth Wiest has an excellent note in respect of the matter. And I quote, the Judaizers in preaching a message of law obedience to the Galatian Christians, 
cause these latter to abandon the position of grace and put themselves in the sphere of law because there was no provision in the Mosaic economy, that is in the law, for an indwelling spirit who would sanctify the believer as that believer trusted him for that work, the Galatians were turning away from the teaching and the reality of the ministry of the spirit in the life of the believer in this dispensation of grace and were starting to depend upon self-effort in an attempt to obey an outward legalistic system of works. Thus, these Christians who had begun their Christian life in dependence upon the Holy Spirit now were depending upon self-effort to continue in them the work of some sanctification which the Holy Spirit had begun. The present tense of the verb here indicates that the Galatians had already begun this attempt. Paul says in effect, how foolish to think that you can bring yourself to a state of spiritual maturity in your Christian lives. That is the work of the Spirit. Only He can do that for you. Now, brethren, What I want to say to us is that, and we're going to come back to it, if the Galatians who had begun the right way, if they could be tempted to try to be perfected by works, what about us who did not begin the right way? Don't you see that we are even more susceptible than they? This Paul was their teacher, you know. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Paul really labored in Galatia. And these people, Paul says, I don't know what more I could have done to demonstrate to you that salvation is a work of God. And, and brethren, what Paul says, you know, is that he publicly proclaimed Jesus Christ to them. It, he, it is as if in his gospel, he painted a picture of Calvary to them. And Paul says, Calvary is supposed to indicate clearly to you that you know half you do nothing. Just Calvary alone. If, if, if the Son of God went through all of this, still for you have to come do something. You know, see, it's an insult to insult in Jesus. We are saying, you did well, but we have to do well too. Because you never do well enough. The Galatians were, so to speak, short-circuiting the work of the Holy Spirit by their fleshly works. They were attempting to live the supernatural Christian life by adhering strictly to a set of moral, stroke, ethical rules and guidelines. So they had their standards, and that was what they were living up to. Don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. Don't wear this, don't wear that. If you do these things, you will be all right. Brothers and sisters, if the devil cannot prevent us from being saved by faith, then he will attempt to hinder our growth and maturity by faith.
The truth is that every one of us has a tendency to fall into the legalistic snare of trusting in our own works rather than the work of the Spirit. All of us, bar none. So we need to always be aware of this tendency. We need to acknowledge that it is in us. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to keep us in a state of brokenness and total dependence upon him, trusting in his supernatural strength to enable us to live the Christian life. Listen to me, brethren. You see, whenever I achieve any consistent period of prayer, I begin to feel good about myself, you know. And start expecting that God must reward me now. Me understand, say so you never do nothing for me when me never pray. But see me a prayer you now. And with all my talk about grace, I have to guard my heart every day and preach the gospel to myself every day. Because the tendency is in me. And that is why you hear people say, I don't know how the Lord could have made this happen to me. I have tried to be so faithful. How the Lord could have made this happen to me? Me never know this would have happened to me. Me are not one of them people that will play church. Me try my best. Yes, you are trying. The Lord now asks us to try what he asking us to do. Trust! And it's not trust and no pay, you know. It's trust and obey. Some people say trust and no pay. For there's no other way to be happy in jam down. But to trust and no pay. Brothers and sisters, it is God who takes the initiative in starting the work in us. And he's the only one who can bring it to completion. God not only initiates the good work of salvation, but he continues it. And he guarantees its consummation or its completion or its perfection. The way in which the Christian life begins is the way in which it is to be sustained. Christianity from beginning to end is a supernatural work of God. It is the only religion in the world that is so constituted. Every other religion says you have to earn it. Every single one. Every single one. And brethren, unfortunately... There are branches of Christianity that preach that too. That you have to earn it. And if they don't preach it from the pulpit, the practice and programs preach it even louder. That it is up to you. No other religion in the world has anything close to an atonement where you are freely forgiven of your sins. Gratis. No other. No other has a substitutionary death as a integral element of it. 
Christianity is the only one. Only one. This thing swinging eh? It look like it gone to trust in the law now too. <laughs> Let's turn to Galatians 2.6. You're hearing me still? Yes, sir. Colossians 2.6. Thank you, Kingsley. Colossians 2.6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you receive Christ Jesus, walk in him. The same way you receive him is the way you have to live in him. I'm coming back to ask us again, how did you and I receive him? We receive Christ Jesus by faith, and it is by faith that we must walk in him. We cannot perfect in the flesh what was begun in the spirit. Brothers and sisters, without the supernatural power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Christian life is not merely a difficult life to live. It, has, it, is in, it is an impossible life to live. And his supernatural power is only possible in Christ. We cannot walk as Christ walked in our own strength. We must not day by day moment by moment maintain an attitude of humility and by a complete dependence upon the spirit of Christ who alone can enable us to walk as more than conquerors in the face of the struggles, temptations and tests that God allows in our lives. So I want to close today by asking the question again. Are we being foolish? How are we attempting to live out the Christian life? By a strict observance of rules and regulations? By our self-effort? Or by trusting Jesus Christ moment by moment? By saying to him, Lord, even the simplest thing in the book is bigger than me. There's nothing that you have told me in this book that I can do in my own strength. But brethren, think about it. It's not too hard to imagine, you know. If you and I cannot even draw another breath, if God, except God gives us the power, then how are we going to do this? In one of the early Psalms, David said, I slept and I awaked because you revived me. If you never revived me, I couldn't get up out of my bed. So how are we going to this, brethren? If we can't even breathe without him, how are we going to do this without him? How are we going to do this by ourselves? Let's start. We're going to pray. Brethren, I, I'd like for us to take our prayer sessions both before and after 
our study very seriously. I'd like to ask us to try and come for the prayer at 6.30. A half an hour of prayer. Is that long? Very short. Brother Allen is going to be leading us in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for your word. It is your word that breathes life into our bodies and into our spirits daily. And we just want to thank you tonight for your servant who has endeavored to preach the gospel. And we just want to thank you for receptive hearts that are open to hear what thus saith the Lord. Tonight, Lord Jesus, we pray that every heart in this room will be fertile ground that is open to what you have to say, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will help us to escape the witchcraft that is the evil doctrine of works and continue to endeavor to trust and believe the gospel. Oh Lord, we recognize tonight that this doctrine is an attack on Calvary. We recognize that it is an affront, an assault against heaven. For Lord, in your wisdom, you determine that the only way that man can be saved is by the perfect substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. However, the deceptive doctrine still tries to enforce that even after Calvary, there is more that we want to do. It's like shaking a fist in your face and saying your sacrifice was not enough. And tonight we resist that doctrine in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, that you will cast it out completely from our midst. Lord, your word declares that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. This is a stronghold that must come down this trust in our own selves, this trust in our own ability, this trust, Lord, this foolish trust, this prideful trust in our own selves. God, we pray even now that you will help us to cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Uh, and bring into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness, Lord Jesus, to reprove iniquity. Oh God, help us tonight to cast down imagination. We can't do it. And if we have to say it 10,000 times more, we're going to say it until our children know it. We're going to say it until the little ones understand it. We're going to say it until it is driven out of us once and for all. That we cannot live and we cannot move without you. Have your way tonight, God, we pray. Lord, we pray that you will protect your servant for what he's doing. Lord Jesus is important. Lord Jesus and the devil is unhappy. Cover his family tonight, Lord Jesus, and protect them from backlash and protect them from the attack of the enemy. Lord, we know that the enemy will come and try to snatch away what you have done in this place but we pray that you will have your own way in fact we more than pray we rejoice that your cross ensures that we will be victorious 
we commend ourselves into your hands tonight. And Lord Jesus, we say, having begun in the spirit, we know we will finish in the spirit. And so, Lord, we will trust in you. Have your way tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we also pray as we are about to receive an offering that you will bless it, that you will move upon it, Lord Jesus, for the furtherance of your work and your kingdom. We give you thanks in Jesus' name.